Next, please welcome Lewis Cantley, the director of the Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medical College and the co-founders of Stand Up to Cancer, Lisa Paulson and Katie Couric. Back to lead the conversation is The Atlantic's Steve Clemens. Wow, power. Does anybody ever turn you guys down for the telecast? And you no. Find who says no. <laughs> Luckily you know, love, for us. I love us. all the names. I mean, there's a certain dimension. I mean, you brought so many names, Katie. I mean, I know, I, no one, I know no one turns you down, but uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm a cynical journalist. I always want to know who the villains are. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking on the bright side as usual, Steve. <laughs> um, let, me, let me just ask um, our, our two co-founders here for a minute. When, when, when you started Start Up the Cancer, it's now the 10th anniversary what gaps in the ecosystem of treatment, of therapy, of reaching out to people did you specifically fe feel you needed to fill? Well, I think, you know, uh, this sort of was born out of my advocacy work with colorectal cancer, right. <clears throat> which my husband Jay died of in 1998 at the age of 42, and navigating the system and having access to a lot of pharmaceutical companies to, you know, because I was on the Today Show at the time, and I pretended I was doing a, a piece on cancer. Uh, and I would talk to institutions and all kinds of people, and I'd want to know what is the latest. And I realized very, very quickly, Steve, how siloed cancer research was and continues to be in some cases, and that's what we were really trying to address. We wanted these brilliant scientists to talk to each other, to communicate, to share their resources, their experience, their wisdom, and we wanted to make sure that they were properly funded. When I found out that only uh, one in 10 uh, really, uh, I think, good research proposal was funded by the federal government, is that right, one in 10, or is it? Uh, no, it's uh, more in cancer about, uh, about 7%. 7%, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> when I found out that now. only 10% were, you know, or less than were funded, I thought there's a huge gap between uh, the, the need for better treatments and possibly one day a cure and the number, the way the scientists were being supported. So for me, it was mm -hmm. the lack of communication and collaboration and the lack of funding. Those were two glaring areas that I felt needed addressing. Lisa, you've raised uh, in a day, I mean, I should say you, but you and, and, and Katie and, the team. and the others, $123 million in a day. I mean, that's pretty staggering. I know you've raised over half a billion dollars. I um, think 620 million. 600, well, yeah, uh, nice seven. Seven. numbers so right. So in, okay. yeah, congratulations. <laughs> um, and I'll ask you a similar question. So as you look ahead and you have these resources, what are, you know, what are the needles that you feel like you most need to move today as we look forward? I'm always interested in, if we have this conversation in five or 10 years, what will we have done from this moment forward with what you've been able to pull together? And you, I mean, just congratulations on the telephone. Thank you, we have a small but mighty team, don't we, Katie? Yeah. yeah. We have the, the great privilege of working with all the major executives in the entertainment business who serve on our board, uh, talent agents and heads of programming, so we're able to galvanize the media in a very unique way that uh, is unlike most charitable organizations. And it's really thanks to the largesse of our wonderful donors that are making multi-million dollar investments, all keeping the patient at the centerpiece of our work. Uh, we have patient advocates in each one of our dream teams, and there are many of them that Katie and, and mm -hmm. Dr. Cantling will speak to later. And uh, luckily for us, we're able to use uh, the bully pulpit of the media and celebrities who are also affected by cancer, uh, losing their loved ones and athletes and performers to melt, make cancer research a first year issue. And, and this galvanization of resources in the entertainment business is incredibly helpful. And Lisa is, I, I mean, I just want to brag about Lisa for a second. The fact that she is oh, no. able <laughs> to marshal so many of these well-known celebrities. I think I realize the power of, if you do have a bully pulpit, uh -huh. Steve, to talk about an issue or become an advocate. In my case, it was for colon cancer when I did my televised colonoscopy, which I'm sure you really enjoyed. Um, but, but you know, colon cancer screenings... But it, but it made a difference. Colon I mean, cancer yeah. cre screenings increased 20% according to the uh, study that was c uh, conducted by the University of Michigan. And I think that we realized then and there, before it kind of became almost expected for mm. celebrities to adopt some kind of cause, 
that they had this incredible influence on public health. And Lisa has been able to attract so many different people. And, you know, they all has, ha have had, as she mentioned, firsthand experience. You know, Bradley Cooper's dad died of lung cancer. Right. My husband died of colon cancer. My sister of pancreatic cancer. And it's very, you know, it's easy, sadly, to find people whose lives have been touched by this who want to now do something about it. You know, I've always wondered, I want to get to you in a moment, Lou, just, but uh, you're like uh, the scientist and, you know, he discovered like a pathway gene that, that was, you know, he's totally cool. Um, <laughs> he's the coolest yeah, person. Yeah, very cool. Definitely. Uh, but I want to ask about the, the government side. You're raising so much on the private side. Is, is the government as we see it today friend or foe? Friend or foe? What do you think? Oh, the government is definitely friends, and, and you know, the moonshot uh, additional boost of money coming in is definitely helping us. It's getting uh, young, particularly younger people who really had a challenge getting funded or yeah. are getting uh, grants we're seeing this year much more than in previous years. So yes, the government is definitely our friend. It's the major funder. But yet, you know, the way the government funds research um, is, uh, is not really designed to go in and quickly take advantage of a science breakthrough and convert it into a clinical trial. We just don't have an infrastructure in government that allows that to happen. Right. And I think it's really important to point out that we do have milestones, that you have to show patient benefit within three years of getting a grant. And we also have innovative research grants. These are for sort of pie-in-the-sky ideas that would never be funded yeah. uh, by a government <laughs> agency or NCI. And we want to encourage kind of really original thinking. But um, I think these milestones really help keep us on track. And, and by the way, we should mention the American Associ Association of Cancer Researchers. There are partners in this. And Phil Sharp, a Nobel laureate from MIT, is the head of our scientific advisory board. And I think the grant process is a lot less cumbersome mm. and bureaucratic with Stand Up to Cancer than it is through a lot of routes. And I don't know, Lou, if you yeah, can, can that. Not that I'm taking over your job. Sure. Today. No, I love, you know, I, <laughs> I, can I just say I knew it was going to happen? <laughs> well, I think yeah. it's just an yeah. interesting thing, especially for this audience. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. So, so but, but you, you, you know, back to the science here for a second. You know, when you're, when you're out there, sort of, you know, Katie said at the beginning there were silos in this. When I, when I heard Joe Biden launch the Biden Initiative, and, and, and part of this was bringing in uh, oncologists, but it was also bringing in SAP. It was bringing people from diverse sectors that may not have talked to each other. As a scientist who, you know, moved the needle on important research, do you feel that those silos have come down sufficiently, or are they resilient? No, I think that silos have come down. I think uh, in some ways, standing up to cancer showed a different way to do things that could really accelerate work. So, I mean, for example... Joe Biden kind of copied us. Uh -huh. yeah. That's yeah. what I thought, similar Joe language. Lear Joe yeah. Lear definitely learned. In fact, his advisors mainly came from people who were funded by Stand Up to Cancer. Right. <laughs> so, so it's right, you know, the review process, and I, I should bring in the American Association of Cancer Research here too, because I think one of the smarter things you guys did was go to AACR and say, we know that uh, you drive, you know, all the brilliant scientists doing translational research come to your meetings, they discuss things, can you advise us? And that's how Phil Sharp got involved and, and the right. other reviewers. And, and so when I saw the review committee, actually originally my wife was on the com review committee. <laughs> she had to step off when I had a grant application. Uh, it, I realized they were really brilliant people who, from industry as well as from uh, basic science and translational science, who knew what it took to, to do a clinical trial. And that was so much different than a typical review session for the NIH would have, because it's typically just very different, believe me. You now, Lisa. Nobel laureate level people right. making those decisions. So let's get beyond the Nobels for a minute to regular folk. One of the things that I find most <coughs> interesting about cancer is that while everybody has a cancer story, talking about it, knowing what to do, understanding clinical trials, just awareness, kind of socializing it. Is, is a task, and it's been with us. And you guys did this super weird thing at game four of, of the World, World Series. The World Series. So, is it, hopefully it's coming up, but there's, I mean, tell us what you did at game four of the World Series, even if we don't get a picture of it up there, uh, Lisa. Well, it's an yeah. extraordinary moment. We created something called the placard, and we believe that behind here you'll see placards, uh, 40, 45,000 people holding 
a sign that represents someone that they care about, a friend, a loved one themselves. Uh, I lost both of my parents to cancer, sadly, pretty much at the same time. And so every one of those signs really demonstrates a story. And because we represent the entertainment business and we have good storytellers behind everything that we do, really, this is one example of how we can come together. So who came um, up with this crazy idea? You know, it was a, a group of us, and, and I believe that it was Laura Ziskin who we sadly lost uh, to breast cancer, who was one of the original founders of Stand Up to Cancer. And she said, wouldn't it be great for us to be able to tell this story? Uh, Major League Baseball made the very first lead gift, a significant lead gift, in 2008, which launched Stand Up to Cancer, and now it's become part of their culture part of their DNA, and I think that everyone that participates in the games uh, is very proud of that moment. It's incredibly moving. It's the World Series and the All-Star Game. The World Series right. and the All-Star Game every year. And, and so when you, when you do this, how many, I mean, 45,000 people at the stadium, but, but how many people saw this? I mean, what's the well, footprint? Well, and that I mean, represents you know, millions. The, the millions and the yeah. viewership, and, and obviously all the family members of everybody who participated. So we're looking forward to having the same kind of impact with other sports and other industries throughout the country, throughout the world, really. Um, our show bleeds into Canada. It's now on 70 networks. We started out on three in 2008 on ABC, CBS, and NBC. And now we're on 70 networks and cablers and, and streaming platforms. Uh, in for the telecast. For the telecast yeah. uh, all over the world. Uh, but I think this type of work that we do with Major League Baseball and other partners continues all year long. And the, the telecast is really just... And Katie, you're, you're like podcast maven and, and out there. I just know you did a, a talk with Matthew McConaughey about his cancer. Are, are you uh, in that finding... I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of love how you've gone... It was his uh, friend's cancer. TV, so I'm sorry? Think he, I don't want people to think Matthew McConaughey had cancer. No, no. His friend cancer. Yeah, his, right, yeah, right. You're yeah, talking his, about cancer. His experience. Uh, but, right. but in this, when you're, when you're doing and thinking about social media, part of it is figuring out how to get the balance between content and sizzle. And I'm just interested in how you look at that social media platform. Because part of the question we have today is, how can folks in this ecosystem copy you like Joe Biden? Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that stand-up has an incredible digital team. I think they're really marshalling the power of digital media, media every other year when we do this telecast. It reaches tons of people, and then we take material, storytelling from those telecasts and make sure they're distributed. You know, Laura uh, uh, bought the rights, I believe, to the Emperor of All Maladies, mm. Sid, Merc Sid Mukherjee's, Sid Mukherjee, yeah. uh, I guess, Pulitzer Prize winning book, and was we were part of getting that on PBS with Ken Burns. So we try to get the word out. You know, sometimes I feel like, does everyone know what we have done in 10 <laughs> years and the science yeah. that we funded? Because it is just so, ins I mean, I just can't even believe it. And I'm just, I mean, when I get to be in the presence of, of doctors like Lou Cantley and our scientists yeah. and, and Lisa, I'm in awe of what's been created. and. You know, I'm just sort of a little worker bee that, that helped come up with the idea, but there were just nine crazy type A women who said, we've got to do better. Yeah. You know, this is not acceptable. We cannot have these kinds of survival rates so low. We have, when Jay was sick, the first line chemotherapy for colon cancer for stage four was 5-FU and leucovorin, which had been around since the 1950s. And I was like, this is just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone who was part of the, the, you know, women who founded this organization all felt the same way. We have to accelerate research. We have to support science and we have to get the whole pu you know, community, we have to get the public involved because we have these huge corporate sponsors like uh, MLB and Bristol Myers Squibb and MasterCard and Roche and I mean CVS, which we love them because they got rid of cigarettes at the drugstore, which was a huge important mm -hmm. thing. But we also want this to be a grassroots effort because we want people to say, I'll give $5, I'll give a dollar. And we want this to, it is really, I think, the premier cancer fighting entity in the country. And, uh, you know, it, we're able to, to support these scientists. Yeah. And they can't do their work if they don't have any money. Right, Lou, you, you, well, I, I, we've enjoyed a conversation today a little bit because I was fascinated about how you uh, uh, took this genetics breakthrough. And, you know, 10 years ago, 
we didn't, we were just on the front end of cell phone, you know, smartphones of, of the sort of iPhone. And so when you look at the advancement, you look at CRISPR, you look at genetic editing, you look at the complexity that we can now bring to problem solving in this. I'm interested in, in you as a scientist, you know, in terms of what disciplines need to be out there that stand up to cancer and your role um, thinks can enhance the game because it's very, di the conversation is just totally different in science than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And, you know, when we got funded 10 years ago for our PI3K uh, women's cancer trials, um, you know, biomarker breast cancer, breast cancer, yeah, yeah. breast uh, ovarian and endometrial yeah. cancers. And, um, and some of those trials are still ongoing. I should just uh, throw in a pitch for this, that uh, the trial we started in collaboration with Novartis uh, to test a PI3 kinase inhibitor with aromatase inhibitor in ER positive breast cancer, where 40% of the patients have this mutation, the PI3K. Uh, just two weeks ago, Novartis announced that they completed the approval trial for that drug. I'd like to think that our team had some influence in that trial design. And uh, the drug- well, That's a huge thing, right? Drug, yeah, it was really, yeah. you know, 570 women in the trial with full control. And that they are now filing for FDA approval with great confidence that this drug will get approved. And, uh, you know, it started out with us working with Novartis to try to figure out how best to design the trial. And it clearly was successful. So this is exciting. This is going to be a new drug available for ER-positive breast cancer patients. 40% have this mutation. Uh, it's also been found in ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and colorectal cancer. And we're designing a trial. In fact, we're working with Sid Mukherjee. Mm. He and I recently published a paper together in Nature, and that's led to a trial with Bayer that's uh, going to be open in our st colorectal stand-up to cancer uh, team as well. So it's, uh, you know, it's exciting to have this influx of money of not just like a million dollars to do something in your laboratory, mm. but 10 or 15 million to actually put a team together and execute a trial and prove that the science you worked on the, in, the, in mice actually works in humans with the right biomarkers. Finally, getting back to your question, this is what's changing science. You know, cancer is moving faster than any other area of medicine, and it's because of biomarkers, sequencing DNA, sequencing RNA, single cell sequencing, characterizing the immune microenvironment. Every day, we get a new discovery that's just completely changing how we think about cancer, microbiome effects. Mm. You know, there's so many things that people aren't even thinking about cancer that we can now interrogate with these novel technologies that require massive amount of, of, of computational skills right. and computating power to do this. So working together as a team, you need tens of thousands of people to, care, you know, to figure out this complexity. And so we need big teams working together, mm. big data, uh, and people who understand how to utilize that and work together as a team. Because Thank you. Real quick before I go to the audience, I want to ask Katie and, and Lisa, just um, if you could move one thing that you've been able, unable to move and stand up to cancer, what would it be? Tweak I, the system. I, for, for me, it would just be get things done faster mm. and come up with ways that people can manage the disease. I mean, I still have so many people reach out to me, they have stage four colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. Uh, I've become sort of this cl cancer clearinghouse for a lot of people because of my profile. And, you know, it's very, very frustrating for me, Steve, to mm. see that for some people, they just, you know, it's very difficult to help them. So I'd like to, I'd like <coughs> things to happen faster. Um, and I, I think that I have to be patient. You know, we were just mentioning, Lou was mentioning that drug, that'll be the sixth FDA-approved drug that came out of our dream team science wow. since we started 10 years ago. And of course, I'd like 25 to come out. Um, you know, so. Well, and we have uh, so many fantastic collaborators to thank for that too, the, the Lust Garden Foundation and ACS and so many other nonprofits who are in the, the fight with us. So we're hoping by engaging all of you in this room and other organizations that together we can do something truly remarkable and make cancer a chronic disease, one that you don't have to die from, but you live with. Because uh, like everything, I think cancer is political and it's still yes. competitive and there's still a lot of proprietary, you know, aspects to the research. And I think if everybody could 
you know, if we could even in include more people and more scientists and get them all involved because we're all, you know, we're all just wanting one thing and that yeah. is to, you know, make cancer a disease of the past. A terrific comment. Thank you. Let me open up the floor for questions, comments. We have one right over here where we have the microphone running over. Just a couple of minutes here. So, yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, Trish Goldsmith, CEO at Cancer Care. Just kudos for what Stand Up to Cancer has done. It's amazing. It isn't so much a question, but a comment. And that really is, Katie, you mentioned that you love CVS. CVS is working with ICER, which is, I would suggest, one of the greatest threats right now to advances in cancer and what the Dream Team is doing. And we need your voice with CVS. Thank you. Any thoughts? I don't know what she's talking about. Okay. Uh, we'll come back maybe after that. Other uh, questions? Maybe I can down and I, 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 get I, back with you. I'd love to talk to you after. Yeah, yeah right here. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Dana Donafrey. I'm a breast cancer patient, advocate, and activist. And want to congratulate you all, uh, Stand Up to Cancer, and all the incredible work that you've done for us. Um, as a breast cancer patient, I would like to ask you a very tough question. I'm actually here with one of my <laughs> metastatic uh, friends who was a patient advocate earlier. But um, especially in the breast cancer space, we see less than 5% of funds raised actually going to metastatic breast cancer research. That is the only breast cancer that kills. Mm -hmm. So whose responsibility is it? The responsibility of the donor or the responsibility of the nonprofit who is selling a mission that they are not, no pun intended, standing up towards um, to really actually propel this uh, okay. disease forward? So that's a great very question. Interesting question. Lisa, Lou? Yeah, so I, I can address that. Um, you're absolutely right. It's metastatic cancers of all sorts that are killing people. Rarely does the primary cancer cure people, uh, kill people. And so we have to figure out how to do studies in the metastatic setting. Most preclinical models are a primary cancer. And in fact, it's, when I remember when I started our stand-up to cancer team, uh, we were treating patients who were all metastatic and yet we were sequencing the genes from the primary tumor. And I said to the team, why, can't, why don't we do biopsies and sequence the gene from the metastatic cancer? And they said, well, you know, all the oncologists in the room said, oh, that's just not done. Uh, we can't get reimbursed for it. It's not, uh, we don't know if we're gonna learn anything. It's dangerous to the woman. They don't want it done. And then I, and I said, but you know, in, in prostate cancer at my institution, we do biopsies all the time in metastatic setting in bone cancer, which is pretty painful. And nobody ever objects in time to come back and get a second biopsy. So the answer was, a surgeon stood up in the back of the room from MD Anderson, and she said, I'll do it. And then suddenly everybody in the room said, okay, we'll do it too. <laughs> so it was not the patients who were objecting to getting biopsies. It was the oncologists saying, we just don't do that. So that changed the culture. Now we're doing it. While Cornell, we do metastatic, uh, for patients that are metastatic, we always do biopsies if they're unlikely to be cured by standard of care, try to figure out what's going on. And we're discovering the metastatic disease is a completely different disease from the primary disease in the same patient. So you're absolutely right. That's where we have to go. Quick thoughts, Lisa? Well, you know, again, I think uh, to Lou's point, if we can um, identify ways in which to move the science forward quickly and, and be aggressive, you know, these are high risk, high reward types of problems. So. Perhaps we should identify a dream team that focuses specifically on, on metastatic disease. But yeah, I mean, I feel your pain because, you know, when my husband was diagnosed, it was very advanced all over his liver. And there was just, you know, and I kept saying, why do we give up on the people who have advanced disease? So I, I totally appreciate where you're coming from. And we should talk about it and address this issue because I think it's a... Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, Katie, let me just, just in wrapping this up, I just want to ask you um, for a moment. We've talked a lot about underserved communities, under-involved communities, communities that were not involved. We've had representation. What, what do you think might be a good path to solving that problem? Because I know you believe in inclusion and diversity so much. But what, what is not happening that should happen? And we'll end Well, I mean, I think the whole healthcare system, you know, it, it's, a, it's a caste system for people who have money and people who don't have money. I know I work with Dana Farber and Mass General for a program to get colonoscopies uh, to get underserved populations understanding about colonoscopies. Now the age has been reduced to 45. We're seeing the incidence of 
colon cancer in younger and younger patients, which is something we're dealing with. You know, uh, that's, a, that's a huge, big problem uh, that I don't even know, honestly, Steve, what the answer is. But, you know, I also want to see screenings that are more accessible, less expensive. You know, I always say there's going to be a better colon cancer screening than a colonoscopy, which really is still the gold standard. And I never say that because I don't want to discourage people from getting screened mm. or saying, oh, we'll wait till something easier and less expensive and less invasive is around the corner. But um, gosh, that is, what, what do you think? I'd like to turn that on you. How yes. do you think the underserved population could be better served? Well, I, th I mean, uh, honestly, I, I think that uh, you've got to go into the communities, go to where they're at, and then find out people they trust and get them in the system, get them in your telethons, get them, you know, when you look at the medical profession and how white it is and how few uh, African American or Hispanic, you know, others are in this. So, I mean, I've been, been on this circuit for a while, but I mean, I think there are a lot of needles that can be pushed on that. So, I think I really, steps yeah. are being, I mean, I think We're steps are being taken. Like the Ralph right Lauren now. Health Center is uh, in Harlem, right? right? And the breast cancer. And so I think, but not nearly enough to your yeah. point, we, we've got to do a better job, but a lot of people just aren't in the healthcare system. You know, one of the reasons women, I think, get screened is because they go to OBGYNs, you know, and they're part of the, the system. When Jay got diagnosed, he didn't even have a GP, you know, so I think it's a huge problem, not just for underserved people, but for people who aren't part of the medical system. But I'm really happy in the last moment that you turned the interview around on me. It makes me feel that. So thank you very much, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> it was Lewis a hard Cantley, question. Lisa Paulson, and Katie Couric, thank you. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary of Stand Up to Care. Cancer. Really wonderful. Thank you, Dave.